How much does empty space weigh? At first blush, this sounds like an absolutely ridiculous question. Like, like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Like some super metaphysical, philosophical, religious, theological, whatever question. This is actually a physics question of how much does empty space weigh? And the value of the weight of empty space, or if you prefer how much energy is contained in the vacuum, is appears appears in general relativity and the first person to put it into the equations of general relativity was albert einstein himself and we have a tendency to view the insertion of what we now call the cosmological constant in the mathematics of general relativity as some sort of ugly kludge as as a weird awkward thing that he, that he had to shoehorn into the equations and i'll explain why in a little bit no. The equations of general relativity naturally allow the presence of an additional constant, of just a number, a single number that represents the weight of empty space, the energy or the mass contained in a patch of empty space. Naturally, it's a part of the mathematics for it to just appear there. Now, our instincts, our instincts would say, well, there's an extra term. We have no real physical meaning behind that term. Uh, there's no preference to select one value or the other, and there's no observation to tell us what it is. So our natural inclination would be to make it zero. Like the weight of empty space is zero. We don't have to worry about it. It's fine. And that's what Einstein did at first, of course. But then he found something funny in his equations when they're applied to the whole entire universe. Because one of the craziest things about general relativity is how universally it applies and in how many different physical scenarios we can put the same set of equations to work. We can put it to work in the solar system explaining the orbit of Mercury. We can put them to work explaining the, the gravitational radiation emitted from two orbiting black holes. We can use it to explain the evolution of the whole entire universe. And when Einstein did this, he found that when he took the Einstein general relativity field equations for, you know, for general relativity, applied them to the whole universe, that the universe had a natural state. It had a preferred state that was in motion, that was either expanding or contracting. And this did not make Einstein happy because at the time, in the 1910s when he was developing all this, as far as we knew, the universe was static. As far as we knew, the galaxy, the, the stars would move around relatively slowly, but in apparently random directions, but there was no general expansion or contraction in the universe. We didn't even know at the time that there was a thing as other galaxies. And so he had to add back in this term. Remember, the term is allowed to be whatever it is. This constant is allowed to have whatever value you want it to have or whatever value is determined by observations. Einstein looked at the current observations of the universe. He snuck in, he put in the value for the cosmological constant to bring the universe back into a static situation because the universe would prefer to be dynamic, to be either expanding or attracting, and he fixed it so that it would be static. Then a few years later, Edwin Hubble came around, discovered that other galaxies are a thing, discovered that the expansion of the universe is a thing, and everyone's like, oh yeah, the cosmological constant, I guess we don't need it anymore because now we know we live in a, in a dynamic expanding universe. So let's just forget the whole thing ever happened. We're good guys. I'm still the smartest guy on the planet, right? I'm Einstein. Yep. Okay, good. Now, that's okay. That's okay. The cosmological constant went back to being considered zero. And over the course of the decades, 
between Einstein, the 1910s and 1920s, and then on into the rest of the 20th century, sometimes some people would come up, like there'd be some observation of the universe, and be like, hey, maybe it's time for that cosmological constant, get a comeback, you know, try again. And be like, oh, no, 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 never mind. We, we misunderstood something or some other physics or whatever. And it wasn't actually until the late 1990s that the cosmological constant as a concept got another shot. And this is through the discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe. 1998, two teams studying distant supernova found that these distant supernova were too dim. The outermost parts of the universe are too far away to be explained by simple cosmological models. The only explanation available that fits the data is that our, the expansion of our universe is accelerating. Now, once you take that fact, okay, we live in a universe with accelerated expansion, you start to wonder how are we gonna grapple with this with our mathematics? What tools are, gonna we, are we gonna use? And with general relativity, you can wonder, you can honestly wonder, maybe general relativity itself isn't up to the task. Maybe the equations that, you know, pass tests with flying colors inside the solar system, inside the galaxy, observing black holes, all this is great and grand and wonderful. Maybe it just falls short of being a theory of the whole entire universe. Fair enough, right? The challenge there is every time we go to modify gravity, general relativity, to have a better understanding of gravity using a modified theory, it falls apart, it doesn't work, it can't explain well-known observations because we've tested gravity and relativity in a bajillion ways by now, and we just can't make it work. And that's a whole other episode, by the way, if you, if you want to hear about it. All that's left, really? All that's left the simplest explanation for the accelerated expansion in the universe is the return of the cosmological constant. That empty space itself has a weight, has a mass, has an energy associated with it. And this constant energy provides for the accelerated expansion of the universe. I know that's tough. I know that doesn't make a lot of intuitive sense. In the next video, I'm gonna dig into more of, of how that accelerated expansion actually occurs. But for this video, I just wanna make the point that the simplest explanation we have for all available evidence is a single number inserted into Einstein's equations of general relativity are able to explain the wealth of cosmological data. Is dark energy really constant? Does it really change with, does it not change with time? We honestly don't know. Our observations, I should say, are relatively poor at the moment. We don't have a lot of data. We don't have a lot of information. Our constraints on dark energy are not super duper strong, as strong as we wish they could be. Dark energy itself is an incredibly subtle effect. It takes, it takes a lot of work just to pin down a value and, and constrain and get small error bars and all that. One of the big things we're searching for in the coming decades of cosmological observation is trying to understand dark energy better. Does dark energy change with time? Does it vary from place to place? Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Or is it really a cosmological constant? We honestly don't know. Until then, we're going to act like it's cos a cosmological constant because that is the simplest explanation for the data. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please don't forget to subscribe, like the video, make sure you're notified when I go live and go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. There's a link somewhere around my face right now where you can help support all of my education and outreach. Thanks so much. See you next time.